Hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to be having a really badass conversation with my good friend, Ferris Kassar. We're going to be talking about business, some sales. We're going to talk about his new awesome product invention that he has. It's going to be out very soon, which everyone can pick up. And we're going to go through a couple questions. We're going to keep it casual. So first question on my mind is definitely going to be, you know, because my friend Ferris, I've known him for a while, and he's always got a lot going on. So Ferris, uh, what are you currently working on? It's a good question right there. Working on a couple things right now. The first thing that uh, comes to mind and what I'm working on, you know, on my days off and uh, after I get off work, you know, grind it out till about 12 a.m. and then do it all, all over the next day. It's going to be uh, Trace Lace, my invention. So basically, it's the first children's shoelace that thrives on the creativity and expression of our youth. So basically, the shoelace tip is going to be kind of like a mess free felt tip marker. Uh, it's going to be interchangeable, so you can. You know, do a paintbrush tip, shoelace tip. You could do a marker tip, crayon tip, so on and so forth. And, you know, you put that back on the marker holder. And that's going to be the first thing I'm working on right now. I submitted it to uh, Make Me a Millionaire Inventor a couple months ago, but it was just too early in the uh, development phase. I didn't have a patent on it yet. So now I have a provisional patent on it. And I submitted it to a company to get it licensed, Lambert and Lambert. So they just gave me back the results today. It went well. Uh, they told me what I need to work on. They gave me a whole bunch of different resources to, you know, just manufacture it and get a prototype done. So that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And then real estate wise, I'm uh, trying to decide whether to go the residential route or the commercial real estate route right now. Got an offer from Marcus and Millichap, and then I uh, got an offer from Realty Executives. So definitely want to open a brokerage within the next two years. So I got a timeline on that uh, with my goals. So just working on that every single day, working towards that. Awesome, awesome. And I can see you're choosing a different, a few different outlets as to how to get this invention up and running. Um, can you explain a little bit about the differences? So some of the listeners out there that might have their own idea or invention that really want to get it started and they don't really know how to get it really started. Like what are some of these different platforms and different uh, tools that you have found through your own research to help, you know, take your, your invention and idea to the next level through these different ideas. So can you talk a little bit more about them for us? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, basically going to seminars, I uh, went to the United Inventors Association seminar about a month ago, networked with some people, learned a lot there at the uh, lab, you know, networked with some people that own a uh, prototype facility, they do 3D modeling, so I'm working with them to get the prototype up and running, and also, you know, you have a whole bunch of resources online, YouTube is a good resource to kind of learn about licensing and what route you want to take, do you want to build a business out of your invention, or do you kind of want to just license it, which is basically having somebody else pay to build your dream. Uh, I'm taking the licensing route with this uh, invention. I think it'll be more lucrative at the end of the day, just build up royalties. You know, somebody that already has a successful product, pitch it to them and they'll kind of build it out into what, what they already have, their shoe. So one possible option is I went to, like I said earlier, which is a good resource, Lambert Invent. You submit your invention, it's uh, $199. They give you a review, it's about, what was it, like 45 pages long took about four weeks to review it and I mean they reviewed it top to bottom they gave me a whole bunch of different resources they told me what I need to work on and everything like that so I've been working on that and also another good invention resource and just business resource is going to be this crowdfunding site quirky.com so I posted my invention on there as well did a 3d model basically they have a community that helps you build the invention up from scratch, you know, you do the features, you do a 3D model, you do a pitch video, then the community votes on it, and if it gets uh, passed, if enough people vote on it, then they'll take your product to market, and you'll get royalty fees off that. Wow, that's some very incredible information for anyone that's looking to get it off the ground. And I think one question that many listeners that do have ambitions to have their own idea and invention that might be thinking of right now, or at least pondering, is what's the route should I take? Should I go with a licensing or should I be developing a business around it? So based on your own research that you've dabbled with, Ferris, what do you feel is really going to separate one or the other? What makes a product or an idea good to be licensed and what makes a product idea good to be a business instead? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Uh, 
Just had uh, Lambert Invent just email me about that. But basically, people look for a value proposition when you license your invention, right? So they want to see if they can sell it with their current customers, and they want to see if they can kind of put it in their current, you know, products more than anything. So what they look for is when you're evaluating a new product or invention is what problem does it solve, or if it even solves a problem at the end of the day. And is there a mass market? You know, is there marketing? Is there somebody that's already doing it? So they check, uh, I would say do a lot of research, check patents. Uh, what I did was I got a patent search and nothing came up that was close or similar to my idea. So my lawyer told me, William Hobby told me that it's patentable. It's a good idea. I should go forward with it. So I got a provisional patent, basically protects it for a year. So I didn't go all in and get a, you know, utility patent for 10 grand. I put about 2000 towards the provisional patent and I got the drawings made, everything like that. That way, you know, if you're kind of unsure about your idea, whether you want to do licensing or you want to build a business off it, get the provisional patent for a year to see if it's viable, you know, to see if people want it at the end of the day before you put too much money into it. So that's what I did with the provisional patent. So it's protected for a year. I'm pitching it to different companies, getting feedback. And right now we're building out the prototype. So we've got about, what, 10 months left on the provisional. So we'll see what kind of interest we generate. And uh, if we generate enough interest, hopefully we get a licensing deal. But I would say build a business if, I mean, it's buildable at the end of the day. You know, if it's just a product, maybe it's better just to go the licensing route. You know, find what you're good at and then just execute towards your strengths and try, instead of trying to do something from scratch. Awesome. Great answer again. And the next question is going to be about basically pursuing this in general, just going towards something, taking a lot of risk and having this idea and just putting in the work to actually accomplishing it. I don't think this is for everybody. Some people think that they could be and they might be. And I think if you have those ideas, you should probably try it out and kind of see. But how could someone really know that this is a route that they should pursue, a route of entrepreneurship? Do you feel like you've always had this in you? Do you feel like you've always had this drive? Do you feel like it comes natural to you? Or do you feel like it's something that you've learned over time? Or do you think it's kind of like like a mix of like both? Okay, great question. Um, definitely think it's always been in me just because my family's very entrepreneurial. So just growing up in uh, Brooklyn, New York, you know, my dad started with nothing, basically came from, you know, Syria. I uh, didn't know a lick of English, married my mother. She came from Lebanon uh, to avoid the war. So, you know, we were living in a basement at the time. Uh, my grandparents and my dad's brother and his wife and their kids. So it's like a three-story house, but we had the basement on the floor. So it was a really small house. And I remember my dad saving up all his money, and uh, he ended up opening up a 99-cent store. That was his first business. And it went well, so he opened up another dollar store, sold both of them. And then uh, he went into the deli business. And I remember he went to this business right across the street from New Utrecht, this high school that was just, it was a terrible high school. Basically, the high school you go to after you get kicked out of a uh, regular high school. So a lot of bad kids, everything like that. So he went and he bought this deli that was kind of run down, and he turned the business around from scratch. And I remember I broke my leg one summer. I was about nine years old, and I didn't have anything else to do. I couldn't swim, couldn't play basketball, nothing. So I decided to work in my dad's business. And just watching him, I mean, day and night, he would kind of sleep in the back, come out, work on the business. I learned how to, you know, do the cash register, you know, uh, do the checkbook, everything, just from a young age. So it's kind of instilled in me, you know, that hard work and determination. And I don't think it's for everybody. Definitely don't think it's for everybody because you kind of just evaluate your friends. You know, you look at your friends. Some are have entrepreneurial tendencies, uh, just like yourself, Matt. Then others don't have entrepreneurial tendencies or don't follow through and don't execute, but they talk a lot. And, you know, you ask them, how's it been going or what are you doing to, you know, make sure it happens. But uh, it never gets off the ground. It's just an idea. They throw it out there and the, it's, it's all talk. Right. But at the end of the day, the results will show. And I remember when I was in college, uh, my first, you know, legal business I started was uh, mindheartbody.com. I had a little personal training business on the side. I was working three different jobs just to pay for college, UCF. But I wasn't learning anything in college. I mean, I was passing my tests, but I would study the night before. I'm really good at memorizing, so I would pass them with C's, B's. You know, I was getting by, basically. But it really drove me to kind of start my own business. So I started doing mobile personal training. You know, that was my first business right there. And I built up a client base, and I was successful in that, driving to people's houses, training them. 
And I could qu I quit my job at LA Fitness because I was making more money doing mobile personal training. So I started building up the business that way. And I decided how, how can I reach more people basically. And I met with a, well, I met my mentor, you know, one of my mentors, uh, Chris Tracy. And he had a whole bunch of businesses at that point that were successful, some failed, some were successful, and he owned three weight loss clinics. And I remember I used to train, train him in a boot camp class, but his leg got hurt one day because uh, uh, he used to play hockey. So a couple months he was out, and I remember just following up one day, just randomly popped into my head, and I texted him. I was like, hey, how's your leg doing? And he texted me back right away like, oh, I can't believe you remember that. Uh, I'm doing great, man. Just had my, you know, just had my son. Uh, I'd love to start working out with you again. You know, you can come train me at the house with my wife. You know, we have a newborn, so we need to be trained at the house, and you can bring whoever you like. So one thing led to another. Uh, he had a really nice house, lives in Owlsworth, you know, very successful, and I didn't know that at the time, you know, because he was a very humble guy. So went there, trained him, and got a whole bunch of people there, and he started teaching me a lot about entrepreneurship, because I, one day I went up to him, and I was like, hey, what should I major in, in college, you know, to make money? And he's like, why are, you, why are you going to college? I mean, you're an entrepreneur. You can make more money that way, basically, at the end of the day, because you don't have a set salary, kind of like sales. You know, you go to college, maybe you'll become a doctor, make you know, 150 to 200, become a lawyer. These days, they're only making 80,000 uh, a year. So like, become an entrepreneur, start your own business. You got the drive, you know, you're running a business right now, basically, and you don't even know it. He's like, I'll help you start your first business. It's going to be an online business, mindhardbody.com. So that's how we came up with the uh, initial plan to start my first uh, legit business. So mindhardbody.com, we started that from scratch. And I mean, basically, I took out a student loan of uh, $5,000, and it was the only loan I ever took out, uh, and it wasn't even for classes or books or nothing. It was basically to start a business, left college, and started MindHeartBody.com, and was, we started the app, everything like that, and I learned a ton just by doing and not seeing the results that I kind of wanted. I mean, we out outsourced a lot of the work to programmers that weren't that great, you know, just to save a little bit of money, but we wasted a lot of time, results didn't, you know, the results weren't up to par with what we were paying, even though it was kind of a discounted price. So you save money, but you lose time. And when you're starting a business and, you know, launching it for the first time, time is invaluable. So that was definitely that was definitely a good learning experience and a learning curve. And we started an app from scratch. And, I mean, just learned a ton by doing at the end of the day. And you got to kind of ask yourself if it's for you. Because I remember, you know, doing MindHardBody.com. It was just me at the end of the day working on everything. And even though I was still kind of going to school, I still ha I was taking classes. I was still online, you know, on Coursera.org, taking free classes uh, from Harvard that were kind of relating to the business and what I was doing, taking classes on Udemy on how to build an app and code. So that was helping a lot. Um, but, yeah, I, I learned by doing a lot. And. I made a lot of mistakes, probably every mistake in the book, uh, building that business up from scratch. And it didn't go as planned, of course, but you know, you lick your wounds, you move on to the next one. So let's talk about one of the mistakes that I'm sure a lot of these people that are starting out with something might have make or might have made this app. The idea of outsourcing this app to people that you can't always meet in person and also people that you can't 100% understand. I think that's a huge disconnect because I know a lot of people are outsourcing to India and there's a huge spectrum of quality when you're outsourcing to that country and even within this country as well. You're outsourcing to a huge spectrum of the worst possible English to very good English and also the worst possible skill to the best possible skill. So, I mean, Ferris, would you recommend paying a little bit more and maybe being able to meet someone in person that's going to grow with an app that's going to be able to build it as it goes? Because... I feel like this is something that has to evolve. And if you can't really communicate with them that well, then that's definitely not going to be worth the value. And no matter what price it is, this is not even going to be worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good question. Uh, basically, I would definitely recommend not outsourcing if you're just starting a business. I know you're going to look at it like, hey, I'm saving money, every dollar counts. But when you're not going to get the results that are needed to make a minimum viable product, uh, your customers aren't going to be happy, right? And meeting somebody face to face and going over the development and what you want and you know seeing their set of skills and qualifications uh what they've done before and how that relates to what you're trying to do business wise i think is invaluable compared to when i did it uh i made a huge mistake i went to india uh, i outsourced my app to a indian app development company and the language barrier was just it, it was insane i mean 
you know, you were dealing, at first I was dealing with somebody that spoke English and I thought they all spoke English, but I guess he, I would deal with him. He was kind of like the director. Then he would tell the app developers what I said, but it would get lost in translation. And, you know, four weeks turns into eight weeks because they kept making mistakes and uh, everything get, kept getting lost in translation. So I think, you know, working with somebody one-on-one -on -one that's local is, is invaluable. And I would highly recommend that even if you got to pay a little more, you save in the long run with the results. And what would you say is the best business advice that you've ever received so far? I think the best business advice that I ever received would probably be, I remember uh, I was trying to come up with a business plan and I was talking to Chris about it and I was like, yeah, I'm doing all this research and everything like that. And he told me, listen, uh, it's good to have a roadmap, a business plan, but you got to execute. You know, you got to start doing, basically. I mean, they can have a war, you know, in the Middle East tomorrow, and that changes everything. So your business plan goes to shit, you know? So it's good to have a roadmap, but don't focus too much on just, you know, writing down what you want to do and, you know, trying to make it perfect because it's never going to be perfect, you know? You got to learn by what the customers want and get their reviews and their feedback because to you, it's never going to be perfect at all, a business. You're going to always see something that you can change, but you want to get the customer's feedback because they're the one that, that's going to be paying for it and they're giving you sales uh keeping it alive yeah one to like further on that like one great advice that i got similar to that about like listening to the customer it was probably from gary vanderchuk who's a beast with this but he said to really pay attention when you look online at customer reviews and not at the one stars and not at the five stars to pay heavily attention to like the two, three and four stars. Cause those are the people that are giving you the most honest reviews and they're also the most valuable reviews where they're going to pinpoint exactly what they like about it and what they don't like about a product as well. So the next question is going to be who would you say that you look up to and why? Look up to, um, probably, Business-wise, uh, people that I know, definitely people that have been there and friends that are doing it right now. Um, uh, Matt, uh, you're an entrepreneur as well. You know, created a book from scratch. You know, that was awesome. You know, you set goals every day, even though you were working in timeshare, you would go home and uh, keep grinding. And, you know, doing your music as well. You know, waking up at like 2 in the morning. Uh, when I told you about that new book I read, Miracle Morning, when I was waking up at, you know, 5 a.m., starting my morning off, writing my goals down, working out, you know, starting my morning routine, you started waking up at 2, and I thought that was awesome. I mean, you know, but uh, also my friend Anthony, he's, you know, an entrepreneur just like I am. Uh, we've been working, I mean, side by side since, like, you know, five, six, eight years now, and he's starting another business. I mean, he's failed in some businesses, he's, you know, but he keeps grinding, you know. And he's trying to open a commercial real estate firm right now. And he's starting a supplement company right now. And a lot of my friends that are entrepreneurs, because, you know, they're few and far between at the end of the day. So they keep me motivated and keep me going because they go through the same struggles that I do at the end of the day. You know, and not a lot of people understand the struggles of entrepreneurship until they're doing it themselves. So you can't talk to a regular friend about it, what you're going through, because they don't really get it. You know, they have a regular job. They go home and they kind of, you know, relax, watch TV. They don't, you know, they don't have to deal with a regular job anymore. With entrepreneurship, it's kind of 24-7. You're dealing with it and you're working on it and you're trying to grind and you're trying to make it happen. So, you know, when you get frustrated or you feel like it's not working and it's taking too much time, you know, just reaching out to those friends that are entrepreneurs and are going through the same thing as you and they're the same age as you is definitely crucial and beneficial. I would absolutely agree with that. So let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about like sales. I'm really curious to know what your funniest sales experience is and the most badass experience you've ever had in sales. That's a good question. Funny, funniest sales experience, huh? Definitely, I uh, would probably have to go with timeshare sales more than anything. I mean, that was in itself a boot camp for sales because I believe I was, you know, a decent average salesperson before I started timeshare. And then I learned, I mean, a ton from that because that's probably the hardest thing to sell on this planet. Uh, because, you are you know, you sell them something for, what, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and they leave with a piece of paper. You know, they leave with a piece of paper saying they own a week. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, because you, you know that we're both doing it, management, timeshare, reps is timeshare, and, and, we, and we know 
how hard that sale can be and also how ridiculous the sale is because these people come in with no intention to buy anything. They come in for a little bit of discount on tickets. They come in and a lot of them come in lying about income and they come in looking at these salespeople like these salespeople are the ones that are being dishonest and rude. And it's so incredible how timeshare salespeople that are successful at it can just turn the table. And these people come in for discounted tickets, not wanting to buy anything. And after they meet you, they're walking away, like what Farah said, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar bill, when the, with nothing but a piece of paper and a deed, and also a a, a a bill for life, a literal bill for life, and is really an incredible sale. Yeah, I think it's um, you know, definitely when I first started, it was the craziest um experience I had, just kind of being thrown into it, not knowing what to expect. Got my real estate license. You know, second week I had my real estate, or the first week, went to interview at Orange Lake, got hired there, you know, that next week, you know, two weeks after I got my real estate license, I started doing timeshare sales, and it was just a whole different experience, and yeah, like you said, they think the sales guy is bad, and you know, they're the enemy, but I mean, I think that's the outlook a lot of people have on salespeople, just because they've been, you know, hurt in the past, or fucked over in the past, I mean, you know, talk to a lot of people that own timeshare previously, like RCI exchangers, and I'm trying to sell them another timeshare, and they told me the horror stories about the last time they purchased, how they got lied to, and, you know, the salesman pitched heat. So, I mean, it's understandable how they come in with uh, their guards up and not want, not wanting to buy, not wanting to trust you because they've been hurt in the past, obviously. They don't want, you know, they don't want to do it again. They don't want to look like an idiot. So it's, it's crazy when, you know, somebody like that comes in and then you end up selling them because you ended up gaining their trust and changing their entire outlook on the industry. So it's definitely rewarding. I believe. Absolutely. Cause it's such a, it's such a rush. And another great thing about it is that you're, you're selling solutions to families problems and not just f savings on money, but it's problems that you really have to look for. And these people don't have a need for the product. And that's, what's another thing that's baffling about it, that there's so many people that are successful at it because these people don't have a need that we actually have to create a need out of it as well. So being that that is going to be one of the most intense, unusual, and unique sales experiences that you've ever had, would you say that one of your funniest sales experiences has been on a timeshare presentation or, or doing the presentation for a family? And if so, what was it? Yeah, I, I definitely think... Um the funniest sales experience, probably, hmm, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many different sales experiences. and Well, just name like a couple, that, let's take a few that come to your head. Say the first one would be um, my first timeshare tour. Uh, I remember I forgot like the entire script, and it was a single lady. Uh, she was recently divorced, had two kids. I mean, I forgot the script, so I was just like, you know, just making friends with her and everything like that, and she started really like me, and I, I ended up selling her at the end, I don't know how it ended up happening, she ended up buying, but then quickly went to shit, because her credit card declined, and then she was trying to leave, and then I was trying to keep her there, because I wanted to sale, you know, it was my first tour, I wanted to get my first sale, but uh, we ended up putting her in a back room, and told her she can call her bank there, because she was trying to go home and call her bank, uh, to see what's happening with her credit card. And she came out of that room all upset, very defensive, saying, hey, somebody, you know, hacked my card and I have fraud on it, so I can't use it. But in reality, she just didn't have the money, um, you know. So she was just prideful. And I think that was very shocking at the end of the day. But, you know, after that, I went, what, three weeks without selling, I believe, after that uh, incident right there. I came close a couple times, but they ended up canceling. And then my first sale was, I think, 28900 And that was a uh, full down payment right there. So, yeah. That's incredible, absolutely. Yeah, I would, if I had to pick a funniest sales experience for me, I mean, the most dramatic one I ever had was the second presentation that I've ever done. And a, a lady literally fell or jumped off of the golf cart. All I know is I was at a stop sign and I made a right turn and I heard a thump, 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 and I looked back and this lady is sprawled out on the floor with her cup of coffee, still upright. So that's why I kind of felt like she just kind of jumped out because she was a little um, you know, on medication and this and that. But that was my, definitely my most dramatic. But even I know I asked the question, but trying to answer it is kind of challenging because 
it's kind of like a collection of so many different tours if I had to pick a funny experience because there's so many little funny things that happen in, from this tour, that tour, this one, this one, and this one that it's hard to really pick one specific one for me as well as also for, for a badass experience. I guess I could say if I readjusted the question to, you know, what is your f- funniest sales job and funniest experience or even your the most badass sales job that – um, you've ever had and if I was to answer it I would definitely say it would be timeshare sales what would you say Ferris yeah I mean I would have to agree with you on that and it's definitely timeshare sales because you deal with a whole bunch of different people you deal with people that you know are well off and wealthy and then you deal with people that remember I had a homeless lady on tour and that was um that, that was crazy how uh, she ended up slipping through the cracks <laughs> and uh she, you know not talking shit about her or anything like that she was in a elect- electronic wheelchair right so I remember I was trying to get rid of the tour because I mean it just didn't look good from the get-go I mean we have we have like a what it was like a 1400 acre resort you got to go through a golf cart everything like that and she had an electronic wheelchair she was overweight so I was like how am I gonna you know take this lady around but she ended up causing a scene and I was like all right fine fine I'll take you and uh, we went on the shuttle bus and they drove us to the other side of the resort to do the tour and I remember, you know, we're walking through River Island, which is the water park. We have to walk through, the, walk the customers through. And her, just her wheelchair ran out of electricity. <laughs> and this lady was like 350, 400 pounds. <laughs> so, and it's hot. It's about 90 degrees outside in the heat, you know, at the water park. And she just runs out of electricity. So I had to like, end the, I ended up pushing her. And it wasn't, you know, a short distance. I pushed her to the bathroom and she's charged up. And then she charged up for like an hour, I think. You know, she just stayed in the bathroom while I was outside on my phone. And she came out, and then she ran out of battery like literally two minutes later again. So I had to push her over a bridge. And then she ran out of battery again when we were in the uh, uh, in the hotel room. She couldn't even get through the doors because she had a uh, electronic wheelchair that wouldn't fit. So I ended up pushing this lady uh, from the from the model. It must have been a mile or two miles. I pushed her all the way back to the. Uh, to inside the sales center resort where we started from and uh I remember her telling me yeah you're the nicest guy i ever met uh but i'm not gonna buy so i was like all right did she recommend you getting a raise too because isn't that the best and by the way anybody out there that does these type of presentations or any type of sales things don't ever tell the person that they did a good job if you're not buying because that's pretty much an insult i mean did that happen to you a lot ferris as well yeah, I mean, I think it happens to uh, every sales rep just because uh, the customers are a little embarrassed that they went on it. They like you and everything like that. So they're like, yeah, you're the best guy. So they try to give you a compliment before they leave. But uh, the way I think of it is like, uh, yeah, I'm the best guy you never bought from, right? I'm the best sales guy you never bought from. So it's like, you know, cut the bullshit. Just tell me you don't want it. What's up, man? Now, these stories you really can't make up. And they're um and so funny and incredible when they happen and not just funny stories because they're just ridiculous and it's like oh my god how did I end up doing a presentation to these people but also just those stories that when people actually buy you know when people come in and they tell you like listen we're not buying anything I don't care what period I am not buying anything and then two hours later they're signing papers to a deed for twenty thousand dollars that they can't take home like we talk. It's just literally a deeded piece of paper and a and a and a, life, and a maintenance fee for the rest of their life, and it's really it's kind of like funny and amazing that it actually happens. It's just the persistence, the persistence, and showing these people that it's it's a better way of doing it for them. And we can keep going on and on, and this is inspiring me to make an entire show about stories because we got a whole booklet. But we want to make this a little bit of a diverse podcast with questions, so. We're going to change it up a little bit. Um, the next question that we're going to ask Ferris is, if you were to go up to a college student right now and go up to one and talk to either an entrepreneur or a entrepreneur, and if you had to give them three p- three things of advice to pursuing entrepreneurship, what would those three things be and why? I think, um, yeah, definitely if I was to go to a college student, I would definitely see somebody that used to be in my place at one point and then, you know, or to jump into entrepreneurship, I would tell them, you know, if, if you're truly an entrepreneur, then start a business. Why are you going to college at the end of the day, you know? I mean, people that go to college are usually working towards getting a, a job at a corporate company, a safe mm-hmm. job, so on and so forth. 
Yeah, like one second first. Like just to add on to this, like I have a representative, someone that that works under me because I'm a sales manager currently, and this this girl that works under me that I'm really cool with, she wants to do marketing in school, which I'm all for marketing, do it in school, but I keep pushing to her. I'm like, hey, check out this amazing entrepreneur, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's a virtual mentor of mine. Because on my blog, I create an entire blog that's about getting a virtual mentor. Now, we all look for mentors, and we live in a world of technology. And being that we work in a world of technology, that works in our advantage so, so amazingly. Because we can have mentors that we never meet in person. We can have mentors that we never actually meet ever. We can have mentors that we literally consume their content online that they get for free and some that you pay for, whether it be books, seminars, etc. And I recommend this to her because he's one of the greatest marketers in our time that, that I know of at least. And I think of how much money she can actually save because if she goes to school and takes these loans for marketing when instead she can just kind of save all of her money and instead just put it into practice, put in the work, trial and error, try this, see if it works, doesn't work, try something else, try this and that, and just kind of figure out marketing on your own by consuming the content of people that are killing it in that field rather than going to school and possibly learning material that's a little bit outdated because the age that we live in, we live in an age where growth is happening exponentially. Things are growing so quickly and they might be growing quicker than curriculums even and not all curriculums, but maybe some. Maybe some. So when you follow people that are on top of it and that are killing it in that industry, then you might as well listen to what they have to say. Because if they're what if whatever they're doing is working, then if you apply those same principles and strategies, then it could probably work for you too. So but let's go back to the question. So three things that you would give to an entrepreneur that's in college that's wanting to start out and Ferris you left off at kind of weighing the options. Do I go to school? Or do I pursue my own thing? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with you on that end. But uh, no, I don't... Hmm, it's a tough, tough question. I mean, I think school's for a lot of people. Uh, college is for a lot of people. But it's not really for entrepreneurs. Because as an entrepreneur, you're always, always learning. Uh, whether you're in college or not, you don't really need that um, structure of having a test a certain time and uh, you have to do your homework by Friday because as an entrepreneur you get it done regardless and you're online and you're always learning and you're searching your product but yeah just take the risk I mean if you're in college right now you're, you think you're an entrepreneur or um, you want to start your business um, you're at that age where you can fuck up and it's not going to fuck up the rest of your life you know and you know when you do fuck up you're going to learn a lot more from it than being successful at the end of the day so uh, I would re kind of recommend doing what I did. I mean, it's kind of risky, but taking out a loan from college, you know, low interest loan and putting that towards the business and trying to get that up and running, bootstrapping it. I think that why I learned so much was because I was so underfunded when I was starting uh, my first company, Mind Heart Body. Uh, we only had five grand total that we put into the entire company that built a website that built uh, 200 workout videos edited from front to back, voiceovers professionally done, uh, um, that built two apps, I mean, with all five grand. So I had to do a lot of the work. And I think, you know, being a broke college student, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur, you know, just drop out and because what are you really going to college for if you're an entrepreneur? Do you want to work at another company? Yeah, do you want to work at another company or do you want to work for yourself? And that's kind of where you have to play back and forth. And if you are going to pursue the entrepreneurs thing, entrepreneurship, I do think that a great thing to remember if you're going to be starting any type of business is the transaction part, the sales part, the part where you actually make money from this business. Because a lot of people get really interested in one raising money, one taking out loans, one shelling all this money into a business where they should be focusing on more as to how do I make money from this. Perfect example, would you rather dump $10,000 into a company with zero transactions, with zero growth so far, or would you rather dump no money into a company that's made you 10 bucks just by selling an idea or a product? I would definitely go with the 10 bucks because that's a plus 10 rather than a minus X amount. So you just kind of have to weigh the odds if the risk of taking out a loan is going to bring you to a next level, almost like take two step, take one step back to take two steps forward, then absolutely. So Ferris, if you were to sum up everything that we just discussed, how would that be? Because we're talking about three, 
things to give to a college student that wants to become an entrepreneur. So out of everything that we've just discussed, how can we say it in one sentence to be the first out of the three that we're going to help these college kids out with? I would say uh, first piece of advice would be drop out of college and start a business. I mean, just start doing it. You know, you're not, there's only so much you can learn. You got to start executing at some point. But at the same time, you got to realize if you're an entrepreneur or not before you do that because you're really going to fuck up your life if you're not at the end of the day. And set, I would say set yourself up for success too. Um, I've tried v- many, many ventures from different types of books to everything from a, a food app, which has different ingredients, which I, I called Alchemy Me. I had the domain, which I just lost because I wanted to create a website based on food that linked different basically the exact nutritions of every single food item. And the the website app would allow you to basically click and drag the different food items with the exact amount into a piece, which is going to be where the recipe goes. And it tells you exact breakdown. I want to call Alchemy Me because I thought it was a good idea, and I think it is a good idea. And I think there's ideas out there that are like that currently. But I didn't have a passion for it, and I didn't really care for it that much. I just was kind of doing it because I thought it was a good idea, and I thought that it has potential for great growth. But that lacked of enthusiasm, that lack of passion for it definitely shows in it. So to further what you're saying, Ferris, I'm sure you will agree, you have to find something that you really enjoy, something that you can get lost in time with, something that you can just start working on and just working and working, working, and all of a sudden you don't even realize what time it is because time just flies because every second of the moment you're enjoying everything. Because going into this type of career in a way, which is a very risky career, which is the field of entrepreneurship, you're going to deal with more adversity than most. You're going to deal with more challenges than most. You're going to deal with more ups and downs like a roller coaster ride than most other people that that work out there and have consistent pay, consistent jobs. So if you're going to be dealing with that much of a roller coaster ride and that much different adversity, you got to have thick skin. you got to have thick skin and you're going to have to be able to persevere. And I think that the greatest way that you can persevere beyond any adversity is that what, what the if what you're doing, you love. And if you love every second of what you do, then that adversity you won't feel. You won't feel the challenges. You might, but it's not gonna it's not gonna really affect you because at the end of the day you love every second of what you do. So, Ferris, what another example of these three pieces of advice that we're giving these college kids is first, drop out of school, start your own business. So would you further on what I'm talking about? The second piece being find something that you really, really enjoy doing and create a business around what you do that's practical as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think Mark Cuban said it best. He said, don't follow your passion, follow your effort, which I wholeheartedly agree with at the end of the day because just like you said, when you started the uh, Alchemy, the food uh, app you were trying to go after, you were more going after, hey, this might be a good idea, this might make money, but it wasn't really something that you were you were trying to pursue wholeheartedly it wasn't your effort wasn't there right i mean the idea was there so yeah follow something that you're good at first something that's going to make money um something where you're going to keep your cool when shit gets hard because it's going to get hard at the end of the day and ferris i've been reading this new book and i recommend it it's called strength finders 2.0 and it's a really cool book because it lays out 34 different strengths and traits that everybody has different personality traits and if you buy the book what they do is they give you this access code to a intense psychological quiz that will tell you exactly what your true personality strengths are and it's interesting how in that book because a lot of people go out there and they kind of try and chase something that they want to become or something that they want to be when the reality of if you want to set yourself up for success, you need to find your strength and you, bec- you need to become more of who you are and stop trying to become something that you're not. So if you can look into yourself and figure out what your strengths are, bet on all your strengths, don't care about your weaknesses because they're your weaknesses, it's meant for someone else to do, and kind of give it your all with your strengths. So it's a little combination of all those. If you're going to do this entrepreneurship, m- consider not doing school. Consider starting your own business, starting something where where the effort and the passion's at, 
and also betting on your strengths, figuring out what your strengths are, audit yourself, figure out what your strengths are. This book, Strength Fighters 2.0, finds exactly what it is. They give you this, all these guidelines. They allow you, after the quiz, they're going to show you your top five traits. In your top five traits, they're going to give you the exact personality breakdown of what those are. And after going through something like that, and there's many tools out there, this is just one, you can really start to see more of yourself. And once you can see where you're, what you're good at and what you're strong at and you go with that, you're just bettering your chances of success. So what would you say the third piece of advice is going to be for these college kids, Ferris, that want to become entrepreneurs? Third piece of advice? Um, yeah, just following what you said real quick, um, the effort definitely has to be there uh, with the book that you were just talking about. A book I would highly recommend is How to Win at the Sport of uh, Business by Mark Cuban. And I see how he brings up right here one of my favorite parts. He goes, in sports, the only thing a player can truly control is effort. The same applies to business. The only thing any entrepreneur, salesperson, or anyone in any position can control is their effort. So, you know, you got to find what you're good at and find what you're going to put your effort into because you're going to spend countless nights working on this. So the third piece of advice would be, you know, audit yourself. I mean, before you, you know, start taking this piece of advice, drop out of college, find something, you know, you're good at that you can put your effort towards and uh, work on day in and day out, even when shit gets hard. Audit yourself and see if you're really meant for entrepreneurship, right? Are you going to give up when shit gets hard? Because it's going to get hard. I mean, it's going to feel like it's not going to work a million times. You just got to keep uh, repositioning your company in. So you got to figure out if you're an entrepreneur first. I like Gary Vanderchuk when he brought up that uh, he's good at, you know, being self-aware. He said, I would love to be, you know, a jet, uh, Jets, you know, fullback, but I don't have the body for it, you know. But what I am good at is being an entrepreneur. I'm good at building businesses, so I do what I'm good at. So I think uh, just find what you're good at and audit yourself and see if it's really for you before you, you know, take the last two pieces of advice. And Ferris, let's say you were given a question. It was almost like a gift. You can ask any question to anybody. What would the question be and who would the person be and why? And take your time to think about it if you have to. Yeah, that's a good question, huh? Definitely uh, a top three people that I would even, you know, consider asking would be probably Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Those would be the top three that I'd want to get advice from uh, at one point, but I would say. And those three guys are beasts. I would love to meet with any of them because those guys are a big inspiration and a big motivator for anyone out there that's trying to pursue their own things. And it's so interesting watching these guys and you mentioned elon musk this guy has persevered beyond the craziest things and for those of you that don't know who he is he is an immigrant from south africa who created his own success everything from starting his own video game which he sold when he was like a 12 or 13 or something like that to selling a company called zip2 for millions of dollars which was kind of like an early google maps meets a yelp and then eventually going on to create PayPal, which he sold for $1.5 billion. And then the money he made from PayPal, cr dumping all of it into the riskiest possible thing that you can think of, which was a private space company. And when you think of that, it's like, how can you make profit from that? He basically just wants to dump $100 million into building rockets to go to Mars. And it's incredible. Not only his ability to build it and become more successful, more of a successful rocket launching and landing than the NASA and I'm not a rocket scientist so I don't know for sure just based on what I've seen and the, the advanced technology and the evolution of it and based on some of the interviews that I've seen of him it discusses how NASA hasn't evolved with the times because kind of been on hold the budget hasn't really been there for it so if when a private company comes along they can kind of go all in with it without the limitations of being run by by a government institution and it's so interesting how he creates opportunities. He doesn't just wait for them or just hope for them, but he really puts in the work and effort and actually creates it. One of Elon Musk's speeches, he outworks people. That's literally what he does. He says it's easy math. If I have someone that works 50 hours a week and over here and I'm working 100 hours a week, easy math, that's I'm working doing twice the amount of work and I can get twice the amount of time 
than the person that I'm competing with. So he's just an absolute beast. So when you got these three people, let's just change the question a little bit. You got Gary Vaynerchuk, you got Elon Musk, and you got Mark Cuban. One question for each of them, what would it be? I think the uh, question that I would like to ask most is uh, probably how long do you stick with an idea before giving up? And I think I would get three different answers from all of them, to be honest with you. Because uh, Elon Musk, I mean, he stuck thin and thick. I mean, when his companies weren't going bankrupt, he invested more money into it, kept going. But yeah, I think that's the hardest thing that I was kind of dealing with when I was starting Mind Hard Body because it was like, you know, it was kind of not working at one point and it was like, you know, ran out of money, but we kept going with it. But when do you really give up? When do you call it quits? Because that's the hardest thing to kind of figure out as an entrepreneur because if you're a good entrepreneur, but it's a bad idea, when do you go to the next one? Yeah, because I know there's a lot of like rah, rah, rah motivation, like never give up, never give up, never give up, never give up. But you can never give up on success, but you can give up on ideas. And a lot of people do quit too early than they should, but some people just, they're just, they just won't stop and they won't stop when really it's hurting them. You know, some people just keep at it when there's it, the ideas, it's not good, it's not with the times, it's an old idea, and they're just, they're just hoping that one day it'll work when it won't. So it's that, that, that's actually a very good question that, that to ask all of them and I do feel like you'll get a different answer from all of them of course and let's say you had to ask them different questions but more specific based on their own success like as you can see Elon Elon Musk Mark Cuban very very much into business success Mark Cuban more tech Elon Musk kind of a little bit of everything you know financial um, automotive with Tesla um, space with with uh, SpaceX um, computers and with uh, zip2 and Gary Vaynerchuk a lot with marketing a lot with sales a lot with social media so let's start with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk let's say you go on the ask Gary V show what would be the question that you would ask Gary V specifically I think um, definitely I would ask him what do you think the main differences between an entrepreneur and somebody that's working for somebody else like the main key differences what would they be and uh, how do you how do you get somebody to figure that out before they jump into entrepreneurship because uh, I know he definitely talks about ordering yourself and you're gonna fuck up your life if you you know it's the greatest generation of entrepreneurs uh, is what he said at the end of the day and how do you kind of figure out you know for people out there that are thinking oh maybe I'm an entrepreneur how do they audit themselves you know how do they kind of differentiate Then we would turn it over to Elon Musk and think about oh, a good question to ask him and a little bit more about his background. Again, for those people that don't know who he is, one thing that really shifted his life was a book called Hedgehugger's Guide to the Galaxy because when he was a teenager, he was going through an existential crisis and he read this book called Hedgehugger's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a very popular book, which is a science fiction fantasy book. And, and one of the th and also a comedy book is written. It's very funny. And one of the... The, the, the things in the book that really captivated him and captured him was in, the, in that book, there's a supercomputer that has all the knowledge and the information in the world. So they go to this computer and they ask it, what is the, what is the answer to the universe? Like, what is the meaning of all the universe? And the computer says, you gotta, you got to wait like thousands or millions of years before you can get the answer. So they wait and they wait and they wait. The civilization waits. And they come to the computer. So like they ask it, what is the meaning of life? And the computer says, you want to know what the meaning of life is? The answer is 42. And then it kind of flips. They got the answer is 42, and they're asking what's the meaning to, to life, and what's this, what, what is the meaning to all this? And now they get an answer of 42, and instead of asking what's the answer, they're asking what's the question. So it kind of shifted his whole perspective of being from going from an existential crisis to almost being this problem-solving machine where he just will just – grow his mind and his intelligence, capture all this information, and just solve problems. Look at something and see it as things that could be solved, not just as problems that exist, that there's nothing we can do about it. And he's obviously performing miracles and doing the, the impossible where most would not even pursue. So for me, I would ask him a little bit of a different question than, than Gary Vee because he, I think he's on a different intellectual level than most. And he's on a different, I think he might be at a similar work ethic to Gary Vee because Gary Vee does work, work his tail off a lot, um, as well as Elon Musk. So, Ferris, what would, what would be a solid question that you would want to ask uh, Elon Musk if you met him? 
I think I would definitely ask him what kind of like culture exists in your organization because I read his book and it's an unbelievable culture that he created. I w- I'd want to know how he created that culture. I mean, I mean, you got people that are just working endlessly day in and day out, whether it's SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City. I want to know how he created that organization and how he got people to follow him at the end of the day when shit was bleak, when he was about to go bankrupt, how he kept those employees there. Because I remember reading in his book, um, uh, he was talking about, this guy was like, hey, well, I need time off. I've been working so much. I need weekends off. And uh, Elon Musk told him, hey, you're going to have a whole bunch of time off when uh, we go bankrupt. Now get on the phone and start selling. So I want to know how he gets people to stick around. Yeah, I remember in that part of the book, too, because I read his biography as well. And it was interesting how his culture works because it's not as mechanical as a lot of other companies that would be in those industries. So for Tesla, a lot of the other companies like, um, you know, General Motors, things like that, they're more mechanical, they're more structured. The people that have a job there, their job is their job. But it seems like Elon Musk is very flexible and it just operates as a whole unit because like, as Ferris was just explaining in that part of his life story, when he had that one employee get on the phones and start selling, that employee he was talking to, I don't even think it was a salesperson, because there was a time when Tesla was on the verge of going bankrupt, and he had every single one of his employees that moment become a salesperson, where they all got on the phone, they're all calling. So it's very, very, it seems like a very different culture. It's very based on what's needed at the time, very flexible, very open. And it seems like the way I perceived it, that they're kind of run almost like a startup even to this day and not as like a company that's been uh, battered with years and years of sanctioned techniques and traditions of the way that they do things, the way that they um, will pass certain operations, the way things just operate as a status quo in them. Um, So we got that question down. Now we're going to the last person, which is going to be Mark Cuban. So let's say we meet Mark Cuban. And he said, I'm going to give you valuable information that you're going to like. I don't have a lot of time to spend with you. However, I'm going to give you one question to ask me, and I'm going to give you my most thorough, elaborated answer that's going to provide you with a lot of value. So ask wisely. And Ferris, what would be the question that you asked Mark Cuban if it was presented to you? I believe I would like to ask him just because um, there's so many different types of entrepreneurs out there. I'd like to ask him, do you believe like there's some sort of pattern or formula to become a successful entrepreneur? How do you stay motivated day in and day out? Like, you know, is there like a success formula or do you just do it? I mean, it's in you. You know, what do you believe? Like, what did you go through in order to, you know, become successful? Because, you know, you, he talks about eating ketchup, you know. Uh, packets and you know living off cup noodles and everything like that and you know just grinding it out not thinking it's going to work and then eventually uh, selling his company for like a billion dollars becoming a billionaire and more than anything I would also like to ask him how does he figure out the right time to sell like when he sold his um, stocks right before the internet uh, bubble crashed and became a billionaire how how do you figure out the right time to do it and how does how does he figure out the right time to just quit on an idea because uh, if you watch Shark Tank or Beyond the Tank, uh, you see these successful entrepreneurs. But, yeah, they're successful, but they've also had a lot of failures. They talk about, you know, some people they partner up with and uh, they end up, you know, just cutting their funding. And what makes you cut funding for another entrepreneur or uh, somebody that you invest in? When do you give up on them? If I had answered this question, I feel like I would take some of the information that I got from Gary Vaynerchuk and something that he values very high and it's something that's very undervalued, but it's a very precious commodity, which is EQ, emotional intelligence. Because the time that we live in nowadays with cell phones, the internet, stuff like that, IQ is not that much needed because if you have a certain type of information that you need you can always just pull it up a more better business intelligence is going to be emotional intelligence and I feel like some people's intuition can kind of just know when it's time to cut it off and when it's when they know when it's time to keep moving forward and I think you can also jump to Elon Musk to help answer this question as well Elon Musk against all his adversity and all his risk and I saw in one interview they said you know why do it 
why pursue something when you know it's not going to work or it's going to fail? And he said, if it's important enough, if what you're doing is important for humanity, for yourself, for whatever, then it's worth to try it, even if the probability is failure. And I think that's pretty admirable. And it seems like after saying that that interview, saying that even with the probability being failure, it seems like he just kind of outworks the risk, which is very impressive. So with all the risk, he just kind of goes all in with the work, and the work will outdo the risk. So I feel like you can kind of minimize risk through working and outworking. 